Welcome to our video series on Generative AI. I'm Kevin Boyd, the CIO at the University of Chicago. I'm very pleased to have with me today Professor Ben Zhao, a professor in the Department of Computer Science. And today we're going to be talking about the future of Generative AI. So let me ask you, we've been uh, looking at um, so many articles these days that talk about these amazing predictions of what is coming with AI and what the future is going to look like. I'm really interested in your perspective on this. You know, based on based on what you see today, what do you think the next big trends are going to be in generative AI? Wow, I mean, that's a big question, right? Uh, who knows? But I think, you know, from my perspective, from a technical perspective, I think, again, people will disagree. And a lot of people in machine learning are of two minds. Um, but I personally, I think that in some of the architectures that we've been using lately in terms of transformers and LLMs and, and diffusion models, I think we're somewhat approaching the plateau of what we can extract from the data that we're getting. And, and the real bottleneck today is data. And, you know, so much of the models are all about extracting the maximum value out of data, but there is only so much data that we have in, on earth in the world and, and most of it's already being fed. And so I think the expansion now is going to be broad broadly speaking, into different applications. And that's going to be interesting to see what does happen and which applications aren't, do turn out to be really useful and, and applicable. Um, but in terms of just raw power and sort of amazement, I think that really exciting sort of bump was perhaps, you know, what we just saw in the last few months. Um, but now we're going to sort of get used to some of the things that we're seeing, and and that's going to become more sort of daily life. Interesting. Um, I, I guess is the do you think it's sustainable though is this is this something that um maybe the curve is flattening out but it, are we going to keep seeing um innovations in the ai field will we be back here having this conversation 10 years from now do you think you know I, again i think it's a it's a very difficult thing to predict because um it really does depend on what we think right now, where the value is in terms of these models. I mean, I think there are folks who are thinking about, you know, artificial sort of more general intelligence and reasoning, but really we're still quite a distance away from that. And, and right now the architectures we have are still very dependent on the data that we have. So if that does hold true. Then just because we're really getting most of the data in the world already into these models, we're going to be sort of slowing down a little bit. But if we do have breakthroughs, if we do have a way to, for example, you know, design new versions of reinforcement learning that don't require sort of new influx of data, then things will change dramatically. And um, whether that happens, you know, who knows? Uh, there's a lot of people, very smart people working in the space. And so, yeah, it'll be exciting to see. You mentioned data a couple times. Um, is there something we should be doing or thinking about differently with data uh, today? You know, I think there's just a lot of things going on in terms of how we think about data right now and, and how we're changing the way that we think about data. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I was still in grad school when I, you know, remember the peer to peer days of dealing with music and intellectual property and so on. And, and of course, that's all sort of coming back again in terms of can anyone use anything on the internet for any reason? Right. And so the courts, the legal system, the regulatory agencies are figuring that out. Um, but in general, that is, I think, perhaps the biggest deciding factor of how we proceed forward is who owns data and, and how much data goes into these models is really going to determine, in my opinion, how fast these models grow and what is the future that of they can, of the things that they can do. Um, you know, they can always sort of expand into new applications. I think that is almost certainly going to happen. Um, and it really does come down to, the ingenuity of applying different models to the right applications to where, you know, you minimize the errors and you really maximize the value and the ease of use of that sort of speech interface, for example. Interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, how the future may change for jobs. It's, uh, it's interesting how often I hear people say, well, my job in the future is going to be taken over by uh, AI, and then that's usually followed by a laugh. But what do you think? Is is uh, is that going to happen for a lot of people? You know, unfortunately, I think so. Um, you know, I, I wrote a little answer to a to a question back in 2017 when before all this stuff came around, and and my concern back then was that we weren't going to be ready for the job replacement, the the ginormous displacement of jobs that we're going to see from AI. And unfortunately, right now, AI as it is is not displacing the kind of jobs that we would like to displace. 
Um, we don't have a lot of robots that are doing the really tough jobs for us. Instead, we're having software do this kind of thinking and generation and writing. And those kind of things are, relatively speaking, you know, a little bit more attractive on the scale of physical labor versus mental tasks. And so, um, yeah, it would be really great to see some of the more robotics things. I know there's a lot of exciting innovations in there uh, constantly, but to see that space sort of catch up and to really get to the point where we can have, you know, was it the Jetsons that had, you know, household, you know, robots chasing after you clean the house? I mean, I think everybody would love one of those at their home. I would love a robot like that. So, so let's talk a little bit about the broader societal impacts of this. Um, it feels like AI keeps popping up in more and more places in the consumer world. Um, I was online creating an e-greeting card, and at the end of the process, it said, well, would you like to use AI to generate the message? You know, and, and that sort of thing seems to just keep popping up in more and more places. Talk to me a little bit about how you think this will impact society, change um, the, the day-to-day of uh, society. Yeah, you know, that's super interesting because I think we're at an inflection point where if you look at the sci-fi novels that, you know, some of the great authors wrote 50, 60 years ago, we're starting to get into that point where we think about what we value in terms of being human and what is humanity. And so there are lots of things that we can replace. And the question is, do we want to replace them? And I think we're seeing some of that play out right now in the marketplace. A lot of people who consume books and art and so on are already making a very explicit uh, statement about preferring human generated content. And so that is something that I think, you know, if you look at like sci fi dystopian futures, you know, where everything's free or everything's cheap except the human labor aspect of it, I think we're perhaps turning that corner. And that will be interesting to see because I think. Valuing human ingenuity and creativity is really important. And in the future, AI is going to be everywhere, perhaps, and it will generate lots of things that are, you know, very commoditized and readily available. And what will be in demand or what will be in short supply is actual human creativity and ingenuity. So I think we're going to turn that corner and that value sort of system is going to flip on its head. Um, and that's going to be interesting to see. So we're seeing that play out right now, you know, and a lot of companies are basically trying to figure out where the line is, right? They're trying to say AI everything and that's fine. And, but the consumer and society in general is going to make a decision about, okay, this is what we value. This was what we really prize above all. And that value system and that reaction is going to come back and the companies will figure out how to adapt and, and to figure out the right sort of bifurcation. So I think that's really interesting. And, um, I think it's going to be very fascinating to watch how that line shifts. Um, my own experience has been sometimes using these tools in the in the more the consumer realm. Um, sometimes the reaction has been wildly positive. Someone's like, "Oh, that was such a heartfelt message," and I'm thinking, "It it was probably better than I might have written myself, but it was AI." Um, and that takes us into some ethical considerations. Um, there are so many different ethical dimensions of AI. Talk to me a bit about uh, how you think about this. Wow, where do we start? I mean, you know, I, I think there are a lot of potentials for misuse of AI. Um, I think, you know, starting from sort of the creation of these models and the training data and respect and consent for intellectual property, I think a lot of those questions are being worked out through the courts and the regulatory systems. But I think, you know, regardless of how you think they got here, the models themselves are very powerful and they are really in need of regulation, right? So if you think about just sort of image generation and the ability to create photos that look absolutely real, but yet never happen are fabrications. So there's a lot of implications on how we think about reality and how we perceive our senses and what is information and evidence and disinformation. So. That, I think, is going to be something that we're going to be dealing with as a society for quite some time, right? I mean, we've been dealing with disinformation online for a while, but this is going to take it to a whole new level where you literally cannot trust your young ears and eyes. And so, you know, how we deal with that in society, how we talk to, you know, members of our own family and authenticate each other on a daily basis, I mean, there's going to be some really crazy behavioral impact as well. Um, so, you know, some of that can be really controlled and, and limited by regulatory agencies and, 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 uh, and governments. And I think, you know, the EU is taking some of these early steps. That will really be interesting to see how that fallout impacts the, the industry and, and how we uh, react to it. It may not be enough or it may be too much, but 
I think, you know, that type of uh, figuring out in real time is what we're going to see for a lot of different aspects of society. I believe there's already been a case where a uh, presidential election in uh, Eastern Europe was um, impacted by what appeared to be AI-generated content. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out in the upcoming U.S. election. Yeah, boy, there are some real concerns, right? I think we already saw, uh, I think there was a, a, a deep fake voice call uh, pretending to be Biden. I think it was in Maine, if I, don't, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, these things are going to keep popping up. And I think uh, technology has to adapt. We have to have better protection over uh, human voices, our own likenesses. Um, you know, it used to be, it was already the case that we would talk to our kids about, you know, managing their online presence very carefully. But now it's going to be even more critical as they grow up because they are going to be that generation of, you know, do we want samples of our voice online? Do we want people to be able to download original, undoctored versions of our voices? Because who knows, there could be, you know, digital avatars of us that we don't intend to be out there. And that generation is really going to reap the sort of consequences of all the things that we're deciding and inventing right now. So thinking about the upcoming generation, you and I both obviously work at a university. Um, we get somewhat frequent questions from students and parents um, asking, all right, so what should the next generation be majoring in? What should they be thinking about to both protect themselves from AI and also prepare themselves for AI. What are your thoughts on that? It's such a tough question. I've had that question a lot every time I give a talk on AI and and, and jobs and, and so on. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we can really predict the future in a clear way because all this stuff is going to fall out in ways that we can't predict. So what I would say is, you know, a liberal arts education is probably as important as ever. Um, being able to adapt, being able to be well-versed in different disciplines, you know, ethics and philosophy are coming back huge. That's just ginormous implications of how you make decisions in this ethical landscape, right? Um, but also technology, of course, and science. And so, uh, yeah, I would just say be broad. You know, don't depend on any one thing because you don't know what the job landscape is going to be. And being versatile with a liberal arts education is going to be really critical. That's great advice. Um, staying in the education track for a minute, how do you think educated? How do you think education may be changed by AI? Is is it all going to be personalized learning in the future? Ah, oh, boy. You know, I think it, we're dealing with some of that right now, and you know, um, lots of meetings trying to figure out like how do you evaluate students accurately? How do you discourage you know um, bad behavior or plagiarism or anything like that? Um, you know. It, it's, it's a real big looming question. Uh, and I think there will be some technological tools, technological tools to help. Um, but also we just have to change the way that we teach and, and we have to change our value system. And students themselves have to understand that there are gonna be these tools and do they wanna take advantage of them? This is coming back to the calculator days of, you know, yes, you can do all the numbers on the calculator, but you know, um, of course, things are more complicated, right? LLMs are not as reliable. They can, you know, uh, sort of give you wrong answers. So they're worse than something like a calculator. But it's the same quandary of how do you teach the value of education and how do you teach students to understand what do they want to learn versus what do they have to learn? Um, and so I think we as educators obviously have to cater our curriculum to, to encourage the active learning aspect. Uh, and to really perhaps, you know, leave the the the, the rote learning, the, the the busy work side of things to the LLMs and, and generators. That's great. We've touched on a few things um, like the the ethical considerations of AI, the um, potential impact of AI on um, political campaigns, deep fakes and the like that sound to me like they may be ripe for regu for regulation or that uh, um, I suspect uh, individuals are thinking about regulation. Can you talk a little bit about what you think might be coming or what you're hearing it becoming in the uh, in the area of regulation around AI? Yeah, I think we're still sort of early days in that process, obviously. Um, a lot of regulators and legislators are still being educated about what this is, what it can do, and what it can't do. Um, so that that's going to take a little bit of time, but I think you know we're seeing some regulatory actions taking place in the EU. I think there's a lot of 
uh, legislative efforts in state governments right now. Um, it's a little bit easier, a little bit more local and organized. Uh, in Illinois, in California, in New York, and some other states, there are now different bills going forth, uh, sort of working on accountability of AI, working on restrictions of AI, when it can and cannot be used, working on how to develop and, and think about ethical AI and its impact. Some of them are specifically looking at different applications, like in the medical space or healthcare, Others are looking at education and others. So yeah, people are really working on this from all different aspects. And so I think it's gonna be great to see a lot of this come to fruition. Of course, the industry itself will adapt. Uh, it will have to, as always, you know, when you have a new industry pop up, you you learn what the regulatory landscape looks like and what you can and cannot do and, and you adapt. And so I think, yeah, the industry will change quite a bit. You know, a lot of the initial marketing of what, you know, can and cannot do will change as people get a little bit more realistic about what are the actual applications that are really going to take shape and how we really benefit society with some of these tools. That's great. So I'd like to close by um, giving you a fairly broad question. What do you think is the most exciting um, possible future for AI? And what would you say is the most concerning possible future for AI? You know, the, the such a wide, that is such a wide range, right? Um, I don't think we're going to see AGI. Uh, I'm not one of these people who thinks that we're going to be dealing with the Terminator or, or those kind of things. But I do think on the negative side that, you know, it, we are our own worst enemy, right? These are powerful tools and misuse. We can wreak all sorts of havoc with them, with elections, with attacks, with, you know, disrespect for human likeness and, and identity and all these things. So, uh, you know, regula regulations and legal actions will have to take place there. Technical tools, uh, like some of the things we're developing here, will come and have a, have a sort of say in things. Um, on the exciting positive side of things, I think, uh, you know, um, I think just language and speech is really exciting. I think the fact that, you know, every single one of us deals with language and speech and, and communication is such an important part. So just to have a system that you know, uh, provides a much richer language interface, I think will change everything. It's something that's tangible that we all deal with and and it's going to benefit all of us uh, in some way. And, you know, we don't need it to necessarily write books or write fantastic essays. You know, I think we still need some work there. Uh, but I think just, you know, having a much richer language and vocabulary and being able to put a nice interactive voice wrapper around all the devices that we have today, I think that's going to be something that really tangibly changes everyone's lives. Um, and as long as you don't ask too much of these models, I think they're going to be okay. You know, don't, don't ask, don't ask for specific facts or dates and things like that. But, you know, just as an interactive like agent and, and having that layer, I think it's going to be a really big positive for a lot of people in different industries. I like that you worked in the Terminator reference. And I'm glad that you think it's probably not around the corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Ben Zhao. Really appreciate you uh, being here with me today. Um, and thank you for joining us for uh, one of our segments about uh, generative AI. I'm Kevin Boyd at the University of Chicago, and thank you.